Now we're getting down into the female ranges pretty soon here. Was it at 100? No, it was not. Okay, was it at 50? Was my were my test levels at 50 nanograms per de deciliters? Deciliters. No, they were not. They were at. What's up guys, Derek, moreplaysmartaids.com. Today we're going to be reacting to test levels after nine years on steroids by Pete Rubish. So um, quite a few of you guys sent this to me and I've had it on my to-do list um, for a couple of weeks now. So I'm a bit late to the party on it, but um, I've been backlogged with a shit ton of topics lately. So definitely a good video that is uh, relevant to the channel. And um, I actually remember Pete specifically for his, uh, he was one of the first people that had like a viral trend balloon video, if I recall correctly, like he actually came out and was talking about what to expect from it and whatnot. And you know, the pros and cons and blah, blah, blah. And uh, that's what I recognize him from um, as far as before I was even on YouTube, I think, but, or at least, you know, early on or something. But anyways, let's uh, react to it. Apparently his test levels are, well, I get I won't ruin the surprise. So I guess we, I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll let him tell you guys. And I gotta give a shout out to uh, Belgrade, Serbia and Prague, Czech Republic. You guys are emerging with a lot more fans. And obviously about half that time, that nine year period I was cycling, half that period I was cruising. So what you see here, 60 days off. Now let's get down to it. Okay, I probably shouldn't have cut off that first part. I think he was just, he was just talking about where his fans are located, but I accidentally skimmed over something. And I haven't come off in nine years up to this point. results were for it. Thank you very much, everyone again. Now, what you guys came for the video for, you want to see what my test results were. So this was the blood work after uh, 60 days after my last shot of testosterone. And I haven't come off in nine years up to this point. This was the first time. So about half that time, that nine year period I was cycling, half that period I was cruising. So what you see here, 60 days off. Now let's get down to it. Test results. Total testosterone. Where was it at? Was it at 400? No, it was not. Okay, was it lower? Yes. Was it at 300? No, it was not. Lower. Was it at 200? Surely 200. No. Okay, well, 150. No. Now we're getting down into the female ranges pretty soon here. Was it at 100? No, it was not. Okay, was it at 50? Was my were my test levels at 50 nanograms per de deciliters? Deciliters. No, they were not. They were at 38. My test levels right now are at 38 ng per dl nanograms per de deciliters, um, which is freaking terrible. And actually, uh, Derek from More Plates, More Dates, he's done some videos on people where he um, there was one fake natty guy who had a 21 level, but he was cut to shreds. So I don't know. I don't know anything about the guy, but I looked at that video and his pictures. There's no way he's natty because he was he was diced, had uh, decent muscle mass. He had those cuts I was talking about and everything and the shape. But he was at 21. And then he also had a video Derek did of guys at like 14. So but that was a natural pituitary disorder. Man, it's like reacting to reacting to reacting to quite a interesting uh, coincidence. So there's a couple that are lower than me, but I think I'm like top 10 in the world for uh, lowest testosterone. <laughs> well, okay. So obviously those videos, you know, got a lot of views and some of the most rare of rare, like genetic outliers, you know, reached out to me to show me their test results from like abnormalities with pituitary adenomas and things of that nature. So obviously not a directly relevant comparison to a guy who's been blasting or cruising for almost a decade. But, you know, just overall, he's, he's basically just trying to lay out his test levels. Are, they're fucking low. Like, yeah. But, um, so I've kind of had some time to think about what I want to do here. And I think I'm going to continue to stay off for another two months at least and reassess things there. So the thing I would want to know first off is what Esther was the test he was using. What was the carrier oil? What was the administration technique? You know, this isn't a lot of time off. If you've been on for, you know, a decade and then you take 60 days off, you know, the enanthate, I guess it depends on your own uh, drug metabolism and whatnot, how much you had in your system. Again, the carrier oil and whatnot. 
Um, it's all going to affect the pharmacokinetic profile and when it's actually cleared out of your system and then you actually have that drop in negative feedback and then your body actually realizes like, holy fuck, I have no test. I got to kick things back up with the HPTA and it's not a quick process, even just waiting for the hormone to clear enough to actually have that happen. Um, if you're using a long ester, like it's often thought, oh, you know, it's, uh, you know, two weeks for tests. And it's like, no, it's, you know, five half lives at least. And obviously that's going to depend on certain factors too that I outlined previously, but 60 days is quite a while, but I would not expect them to be really recovered, to be honest, like after 10 years of use, just letting the hormone clear out of a system and then, you know, waiting for HPTA to kick back up. I would not really expect good numbers at this point anyways. Get another lab panel done after four months. Again, though, that's depending on, I guess, what else, if he's doing anything right now, if he's on HCG or what he's doing at this exact moment. And see where we're at, see if anything's coming back. I'm going to do a little more HMG and see if I can bring things up because my FSH bounced back a little, but my LH really didn't much at all. Okay, so he's on HMG, which is uh, notable. So I'm going to try some more HMG, see if I can bring it back. And in the meantime, I mean, yesterday I pulled... So by the way, if you don't know, HMG is a combination of luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone. So it's like, it's more broad spectrum than, than uh, just a luteinizing hormone mimic like HCG. HCG is actually only stimulating the Leydig cells. It absolutely does nothing for the Sertoli cells because it does not act as FSH does. So it only acts like LH, it does not act like FSH. So it's not a comprehensive means of achieving, you know, uh, restoring fertility. So you can restore fertility just by, you know, lighting cell sim stimulation, but the more efficient approach, more broad spectrum approach would be the combination of something that acts like LH and something that acts as FSH or bioidentical, you know, LH and FSH in the case of uh, HMG. Um, 287 and a half kilos for four reps and I could add five. So, I mean, I'm pretty happy that I can even pull that with 38 test levels which are that of, the, of a female uh so i think right now honestly i think i could pull 705 i think i could pull 320 kilos with 38 test levels um but i think what i'll do i'm going to try to set a goal of getting to a 750 deadlift with uh no testosterone in my body and see how that goes uh bench is so iffy because my rotator cuff might be fully torn right now um, I'm really not sure. I need an MRI done. I can still kind of bench, but it gets really aggravated and feels terrible. So bench is harder to gauge um, how it's doing because my right arm is so un unstable, unstable, you know, feels terrible. Um, the other thing I got to point out now, there's an article that ties into what these results were. So there's an article I put up called the top five things I wish I would have done differently with regards to anabolics. So I'm gonna link that article in the description and as well in the comments. Check that article out. It's the five biggest things I would have changed about how I went about getting started with stuff and, and mistakes I've made. So that's a really informative article. Check that out. But yeah, I think, I think I'll try to push for a 750 deadlift. And if I can get to there, I might try to push for 800 with no test, um, test levels at all. So I'm, I'm literally below natural. Here's the thing, way below natural. My levels right now are 22 times lower than they were when I was lifetime natty. So when I was lifetime natty, I had my test levels I measured when I was 19 years old. And when I was 19 years old, lifetime natty, my uh, t total testosterone was 832. So 832, right now I'm at 38, 22 times lower than at that point. And at that point I pulled 740 on a stiff bar. So I'd like to surpass my natural PR um, that I hit when I was lifetime natty with 22 times less testosterone, we'll see. But yeah, I'm gonna do a little breakdown here coming up. Um, you're gonna see the actual, the whole panel of all the health results, not just testosterone. I'm gonna go through everything. So check that out. Check out my website, subscribe, uh, comment. I tried, to, I tried to get back to everybody in the comments of the last video. I tried to respond to all of you. So I appreciate the support big time. You guys are what, you know, watch my videos make this, this happen. So thank you. Hey guys, so here we are with the lab results. This is 60 days after the last shot of testosterone. And obviously you know what the testosterone levels were, but I'm gonna break down everything. Nothing here is out of the normal range. Um, everything's in pretty good shape. Really happy with it. Uh, glucose. So there's liver enzymes 
you know, I would question how close to the blood test he lifted regarding this ALT. But in general, you know, most bodybuilders would consider this acceptable. You know, I would obviously keep an eye on this personally. And I would question the parameters under which the test was undergone in terms of what you did the days leading up to it. But other than that, you know, it's not too bad. Obviously, this is the main thing of concern here. Glucose, fasted glucose was 89. So honestly, I've had this as low as 69, which is really good, but. Oh shit, I didn't even see that up here. Yeah, so. But 89, still well within the normal range. Um, a couple other notable factors. Kidney functions, let's look at kidney functions. Uh, creatinine, creatinine is probably the biggest one. 1.19, the lowest I've ever had with that is like 1.14. So I'm actually, I'm gonna try a kidney cleanser for a month and I'm gonna see if I can get that even lower. Not that it's bad now at all, but I'm gonna see if this kidney cleanser, how good it is. Test run it for you from Leviathan Nutrition and see how well that works. So I'll keep you posted. BUN, um, that was 20, which I'm typically like 19, 20 on that. So that's pretty good. GFR, 82, that's good. Uh, those are the most notable things. Let's go down to liver enzymes, AST, ALT, 40 and 48. Those are good. Obviously, um, one thing is the, the more you weigh, the higher your creatinine is typically going to be. And then if you're training hard or really breaking your body down, your liver enzymes and kidney functions will tend to rise. So even if AST and ALT are slightly elevated, that's, that's not a big deal. Like that's pretty. And so if you wanted a better, I'm not, I'm just talking to whoever's watching this. Um, if you want a more accurate assessment of your GFR, the ideal would be using a cystatin C calculated eGFR because the creatinine calculated one is wildly inaccurate, unfortunately. If we're going to base it off of the gold standard of inulin clearance, we would ideally have cystatin C calculated estimated glomerular filtration rate, and that would give you a more accurate assessment because some guys who are very muscle bound, train hard, eat a ton of protein, blah, blah, blah. They will sometimes see, you know, artificially lowered EGFR based on their creatinine and then think that they're in, you know, getting into chronic kidney disease territory when in reality, it may just be a blip based on the estimation being on the creatinine rather than the cystatin C. So definitely something to keep in mind if you have a, uh, an odd looking EGFR, that would be the immediate follow-up I would do. Like that's pretty normal, unless you're doing like no training. So right there, you see it, obviously the 38 testosterone level, which is horrendous. Um, it's just crazy to me that it's that low because I did a post cycle therapy, took everything, HCG, HMG. Okay, so what I'm wondering is how did you already do a PCT if it's only been 60 days? That's a pretty quick PCT if you started after hormone clearance, unless you started it concurrently while you're clearing the hormones, because I guess hypothetically you could just skip, you know, the period of time waiting for negative feedback to stop um, and just go straight to the source and, you know, manually stimulate um, the lighting cells, the sertility cells, etc. cetera. But um, I don't know if enough time has passed to really see, you know, what you can get out of it. Granted, this was like almost a month ago at this point. So I'm sure things, we should have an update like soonish, I would think, on something. Clomid Novodex, and it just didn't bounce back at all. So that's. So what was the PCT? G HMG, Clomid Novodex, how low? Because I did a post cycle therapy, took everything, HCG HMG, Clomid Novodex, and it just didn't bounce back at all. So that's kind of interesting. Estradiol is below fifteen, so estrogen's in range. That's all under control. So yeah, obviously you would expect a not even detectable estradiol based on the fact that his test is so low. Like you need the test as a prerequisite to aromatize into estradiol. So obviously you would expect this to be not sufficient, you know, based on his total T being crashed. And then we got FSH 2.6, LH 1.2. So even though it says FSH is in the normal range, I'm really cold right now, by the way. Oh, even though it says FSH is in the normal range, 2.6 is pretty low. So it bounced back a little, but not great. Hematocrit 45, typically I'm like 49 to uh, 51, somewhere in that range. So the thing that is notable to me though, is how his FSH is in range, but low. And his LH is, it's clinically low, but it's not like 
guys who are tip like totally shut down, they'll have an undetectable LH. But even though he's on HCG and HMG, which are things that will cause negative feedback, his use of SERMs seems to have circumvented that or he's just off of them now. So there is no negative feedback now from the LH mimic and the you know recombinant, um, the mixture of the uh, LH and FSH in the uh, HMG. But like obviously something is going on. Like the pituitary and the hypothalamus are doing something here, which is a good sign. Although it's not, it's not optimal by any means, these are detectable. So if them being detectable is a good sign to me, it means that the, the framework, at least up here, is fucking working correctly. Now, are the gonads going to respond? You know, it doesn't seem like right now he's basically functioning off of, off of trace adrenal steroid production. So um, I guess it remains to be seen, but the LH is still pretty low. So I don't know. I need more context in terms of like how long ago was the PCT? Like, was it, did you just finish it? Like right during this blood test? and we would see the results of whatever that PCT was from this blood test, or did you come off of it weeks before this blood test, and now we're seeing just the remnants of your natural production here. Like, I would, I would need to know if this is his T level even like right now, like on HC, HCG and HMG or not in order to um, really know exactly, well, I don't know, make my speculation. That range. Hematocrit and hemoglobin are your red blood cells, how thick your blood is. You don't want them too high, but you don't want them too low either. So 45 is as low as I would want it. And then we got a bunch of this stuff. It's not quite as important. Now this does not have lipid panel on it with my cholesterol levels. I'm guessing they're in pretty good range, but I'd be real curious to see where those are at. I'd be curious to see what his HDL is at. Like I would imagine his HDL would be not great based on the fact that his estrogen is in the toilet, but the fact that his androgens are so low too, like I don't know if that would, you know, net neutral it out or what, but I mean, I wouldn't expect ideal lipid levels until things have kind of uh, been restored. So let's compare this to a lab panel from six and a half years ago when I was 23 years old. So this was 23 years old. I believe I was on 250 milligrams of testosterone a week. Um, you can see hematocrit is quite a bit higher, 49. Obviously, the more testosterone you have in your body, your blood's going to be thicker, your hematocrit's going to be higher. So you see that there. Um, you can see this looks a little different. Glucose, 83. So it was, what, 89 now? So it's about the same. Um, BUN was 17. Whereas now it's uh, 20. So, I, I mean, those are pretty much the same. I'm not too worried about that. Creatinine 1.17 compared to 1.19 now. About the same. Interesting. Those liver enzymes are basically the same on cycle. Or, you know, if you consider this a cruise or what. But basically the same as now. GFR 87 compared to 82. About the same. And then AST and ALT 43 and 42. About the same. So, you can see all my health and my parameters. We're basically identical on 250 milligrams a week of testosterone to what they are now, which is why um, hormone replacement therapy isn't bad for your health. Testosterone itself in um, doctor clinical dosages is not bad for you. It doesn't negatively affect your uh, health parameters. It's when things get abused and when people add in anabolic steroids that it wreaks havoc on their health parameters. So the only difference here between being off testosterone completely and being on testosterone was the uh, hematocrit levels were about four points higher. And then obviously the testosterone levels are way different because look here, we're off the charts. We're over 1500 on the testosterone. So this one was not, there's two types of testosterone tests and this one was not one that recorded it over 1500. So I just, it was, I know that 125 milligrams a week puts me at about 1490 testosterone. So I was probably 2,000 plus here, maybe 2,500 from 250 a week. Now note this too, this is very interesting. LH and FSH were basically nothing. So my LH was 0.1 compared to now we're at 1.2. So LH rebounded a little bit, but really not much at all. And then FSH 0.2, less than 0.2, and now we're up to 2.6. So that tells me the HMG did a little bit. I ran uh, seven bottles of HMG, 75 IUs, and that rebounded my FSH a little bit. But I don't know, the HCG didn't seem to really get the LH coming back, so that's... 
Well, your HCG would shut down your LH and FSH through negative feedback. It's a LH mimic. It would not show up in a blood test as LH. Like the serums are what would increase your FSH and LH, but using an LH mimic to increase intratesticular testosterone production, that testosterone would aromatize into estrogen, then provide negative feedback to the HPTA, which would prevent the hypothalamus from producing GnRH, which would then prevent the pituitary from making LH and FSH. So this is why if you're on exogenous HCG, you're shutting yourself down. Like despite the fact that you're, you're basically bypassing your body's feedback system to go straight to the telling your balls to produce test, <laughs> but you're like actually shutting down the gonadotropins and the GnRH simultaneously, because why would you produce those if you already have enough lighting cell stimulation from whatever you're using exogenously? So this is where it's a bit of an interesting scenario though, because it sounds like concurrently he was using an LH mimic, which would not show up as LH in your blood work, and it would provide negative feedback and shut down your LH and FSH. Not directly though, by the way, indirectly through the testosterone production, through the you know estrogen per conversion, et cetera. Then you're using HMG, which is the combo of um, LH and FSH. So like theoretically those could increase your blood test results, but based on the fact that you're directly introducing it into your bloodstream rather than it actually stimulating your body to make those gonadotropins itself. But then the serms that he's using, the Novidex and the Clomid, those are things that would occupy estrogen receptors and then prevent um, negative feedback from occurring, thus stimulating the HPTA and, you know, telling it, oh, you know, we don't have enough estrogen, so we got to make GnRH, which then goes and makes the gonadotropins, which then, you know, we have LH and FSH endogenously, which then stimulates uh, Leydig cells and Sertoli cells. So it's kind of interesting because there's like opposing things going on here. And as far as the HMG goes too, and it registering in blood work or not, like it is just straight up like from menopausal women's urine. So it is straight up LH and FSH, but it comes with a lot of the other things that you come, you may get some like byproduct, like proteins in it and things that may be problematic. So this is why recombinant um, FSH and LH are actually preferable, at least um, from what I understand, they seem to be the preferred modalities of fertility restoration going through that pathway. I think earlier I might've said that HMG has recombinant FSH in it and LH. And that was, um, I don't recall if I said that, but that was definitely a I meant the other thing, the recombinant FSH and LH are the things that are meant to phase out the HMG. HMG is comprised of pure LH and FSH and they're bioidentical. So it's like literally endogenously produced like the name implies, human menopausal gonadotropin. It is literally, literally produced in uh, like, think of the LH and FSH levels of a menopausal woman who is not responding to gonadotropins, their HPTA or their HPOA, you know, freaking the fuck out and is making a shit ton of LH and FSH. And it is uh, purified from their urine and then literally injected in order to um, replicate that, uh, you know, stimulation of the uh, um, cells they act upon. Oh, that's, the, that's the new test, new panel. We'll go down a little more here. Estradiol, I did not have, I was not on an estrogen blocker. My estrogen was 150 compared to now it's below 15. As you'll see right here, below 15. But the highest I've ever had my estrogen recorded was like 185 when I was on trend. So still quite a bit of a difference. Now you have to consider if you're using trend and you are using electrochemiluminescence immunoassay blood test results to assess your estradiol levels, you're probably going to get some cross detection in there. The likelihood that you're going to get an accurate representation of your estradiol in the body when you are also on a compound like trenbolone or you know numerous other anabolics actually is quite low and this is why i always recommend getting sensitive assay testing using liquid chromatography with tandem mass spectrometry for several of the uh, sex hormones that would otherwise be artificially um, inflated or fucked with when you're using synthetic anabolics or derivatives or analogs or whatever but that's pretty much the breakdown 23 years old on 250 a week compared to 29 years old on nothing and yeah you see it so those are the main things obviously one other thing here too my cholesterol levels this was the old panel when i was 23 on 250 a week um, 184 total tests triglycerides 105 typically my triglycerides are below 100 now so that's come down a bit 
HDL was 37. Highest I've recorded was 50, 50 something was my highest recorded HDL, like 55 or it might've been 60 even. Um, LDL 126, which is- So one thing to note about the HDL and whatnot is in general, you will see guys on TRT who do have not low HDLs always, you know, you do often see it though, but I mean, um, it's a lot more difficult to maintain what is generally accepted in the medical community as like optimal health numbers for um, HDL, um, as well as in some cases, SHBG too. So that is something to definitely keep an eye on if you are on TRT and is, uh, can be, you know, how problematic is it at the end of the day, you know, depends on the person that's kind of tough to speculate, but I mean, those are two markers in particular that are, uh, a little bit more, uh, difficult to modulate when you're, uh, well, not difficult to modulate, difficult to stay in kind of like the sweet spot when you're uh, on TRT. Six, which is about typical for me. And note that they've actually lowered this range. It's zero to 100 now. But I mean, really, if you're at 120 LDL, that's pretty good because LDL is mainly genetic, whereas HDL is what is affected by what you're putting in your body. So your, your LDL will still take a hit if you take anabolic steroids. But what really happens, the biggest thing that gets destroyed is your HDL. Your HDL cholesterol is going to go drop to nothing, basically. No matter what you take, even if you took something like Anavar, your, your HDL would drop in half. So if I took Anavar, this would go down to about 18, 19. Um, and then if obviously other things, trend and stuff would make it even lower, 10 or less. So probably jack the LDL up to like 180. But yeah, that's it. Appreciate you guys watching. Thank you for the support. Shout out to my Finland friends. Shout out to my Aussies. And uh, everybody just appreciate the support guys all right so that was interesting and you know i've kind of given my feedback already throughout the video so i don't really have a whole lot to add but hopefully uh we get an update here in the next uh, little bit i did just watch this video which maybe i should have watched it after and i kind of watched through this and it sounds like he has blood work on the way so maybe we will uh keep an eye on things and see you know, things start trending up because hopefully, obviously we want to see this guy recover. We don't want to see anybody walking around with a 38 nanogram per deciliter total T. That would fucking suck, especially guys who are, you know, doing the right things after and trying to actually take the proper steps to recover and are actually taking their health seriously after, you know, realizing, you know, changing their mindset or whatever it is. So definitely a good uh, story to follow for guys who are enhanced and are, you know, worried about recovering post you know, whatever, you know, you're doing your enhancement practices when you want to restore fertility, when you want to, uh, even if you want to come off someday, if you're blasting and cruising and actually seeing a real life example of a guy who has been, uh, you know, pretty on his shit for about a decade, blasting and cruising intermittently here and there and, uh, never coming off and then trying to restore everything thereafter. How difficult of a process is it really going to be? Um, for him in particular, we shall see. So anyways, thank you guys for watching. Like, subscribe, check out my blog, moreplates1dates.com. Follow me on Instagram, at moreplates underscore more dates, Facebook, Snapchat, Bitchy, Twitter, TikTok, Apple Podcasts. If you want to support the channel, you can check out anything I'm associated with in the video description below, including my TRT clinic. It's all telemedicine from the comfort of your own home, as well as my recommended lab tests and diagnostics through my HRT clinic. Um, we have highly qualified patient care coordinators and doctors who I've vetted myself personally and handpicked for the level of information they put forth, you know, the quality of interpretation, the quality of service and oversight for the clients. Everything is top notch and it reflects the same quality of information I try to put out on my channel and anything else I'm associated with, it's all in the video description below. Thank you guys for watching. Talk to you soon.